So, um, all right, this is chapter 23, right? Yes. Okay, great. The data of the market. I have forgotten or misplaced my study guide somehow, so okay. I'm relying on you to I'll... ask me the right questions. All right, I'll be the moderator. Okay, so section one, the theory and the data. Under which conditions are catalactics, catalactic insights valid? Market conditions. Bam. Final answer. <laughs> okay, here's a comment. There is no such thing as a mere recording of unadulterated facts, apart from any reference to theories. Yeah, the comment about that that I would make is, um, catalactics is always valid in every situation in which their market conditions exist. Mm -hmm. It's not like a sometimes or an you know, uh, occasional rule. Um, it's because it's not like a science like that. It's, it's axiomatic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Two, the role of power. What determines market phenomenon according to the historical school? What determines power? Mm -hmm. What determines market phenomenon? according to historical school. What determines market phenomenon? Um, that buyers and sellers are free to choose a product, to buy a product or abstain from buying. Mm -hmm. um, that a person is free to produce a product and to keep the product of his or her labor. Um, in, it's in contrast to a like a communist or socialist yeah. um, rule. I'd say scarcity. Oh, right. Yeah, scarcity, of course. You can't have a market without that. Right. Good point. And I think you're kind of getting there with socialists and communists. Well, Who has the real power in market processes? Uh, the consumer. The customers. They have the real power because they are the ones who put the money, they give the money to the entrepreneur or mm -hmm. abstain from buying. Right. So people would think that the capitalists or the entrepreneurs are the ones that have all the power, but they are the slaves of the, the customers. They have to do what the, the customers want. Three, the historical role of war and conquest. Here's a comment. The teachings of catalactics do not re refer to a definite epoch of history, but to all actions characterized by the two conditions, private ownership of the means of production and the division of labor. So here's a question. Give an overview of the four points Mises makes in this section. I'll, I'll leave that one for you. Okay, <laughs> so so the section of this is called the historical role of war and conquest, and I don't know specifically the four points. I know Mises talked a lot about the different um, kind of points in history where you had the plunders, the con, like the conquistadors. I guess you'd call them. Um, I think there were particular set of conquerors they were the like spanish ones right conquistadors oh it's like a right okay um, but they're, yeah people like that right they're, they rule by force right and they rely on producers or what do they call it the bourgeois the bet that's the class of producers i think so i think that's the middle class mm -hmm. so in order for uh, the conquestors to exist, there needs to be that middle class to, to, to take from. Ah, uh, right, right, yes. As opposed to um, the bourgeois that can exist on their own. Bourgeois doesn't need the conquerors, the conquerors need the bourgeois. Because mm -hmm. if the conquerors have anything nice, it's because it came from the producers. And he makes that point about uh, Latin society, mm -hmm. that the Romans were like conquered for a time and 
anyone who had anything nice during that time, it was because of the, the Romans who, like, were, had markets. Right, like, he talked about the Vikings, and a lot of their accomplishments or their advancements were just based on the people that they conquered and these they stole. And, yeah, he kind of just really lays it out that he did say that I don't know if he said it was necessary. He definitely said it was a part of human um, history, the phase of war and conquest. But then he said civilization, civilization today doesn't need that. I don't know if he fully said that it needed it and probably doesn't fit. Yeah, I don't think anyone ever needs someone who's saying, give me that or I'll kill you. Right. <laughs> That's, I could do without that. I think all the way back to the beginning of time. All the way back to the beginning of time. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we'd be alright without people like that. Right. Okay. What's next? So what was it to recap, what was the question and answer? So he said give an overview of the four points Mises makes in this section. Uh alright. That you don't need the conquerors, the conquerors need the producers. Um, and what yeah, were the other it, two points? This is a short summary, I'll read it. Okay. The theorems of catalactic supply whenever there is private ownership of the means of production and division of labor. The existence of robbers and murderers does not refute catalactics, but merely provides data that influences prices as set on the market. That makes sense. Uh -huh. There's a lot of robbers and murderers, you need to price that in. Right. Historically, those conquerors who did not embrace bourgeoisie or bourgeois society faded into insignificance. Right. Plunders require peaceful entrepreneurs to survive, but the entrepreneurs do not require plunders. Excellent. Okay. Um Great recap. Thanks, Robert Murphy. <laughs> so, real man as a datum. Ah, uh, yeah. A comment. There is no yardstick that a scientific investigation can apply to human action other than that of the ultimate goals that acting individuals want to realize in embarking on definite action. There's no question related to this. I'll read the summary. Great. For real men as datum. Economics deals with real men in real actions. Economics does not analyze the behavior of economic man or of statistical average man. Right. Homo economicus. Right. Catalectic deals with man as he is, not as he would be in a perfect world. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because it seems like, so when it says economics does not analyze the behavior of economic man or a st statistical average man, but you can make a lot of decisions and actions based on like the averages of, you know, the data set you have. Oh yeah. Maybe, I think we talked about this way earlier in the book. But when it comes to like a specific man, they just... I struggle to think about like, cause there's useful information in like statistics of men. Yeah, totally. I don't think Mises would deny that. I think he's differentiating between economics and catalactics. Mm -hmm. Because catalactics is the study of human action in a market that you know what man will always do. Man will always pursue their ends, whatever their ends are. We can't determine whether those are good or bad ends. We can only determine whether or not the means that were chosen are good means to attain those ends. Mm -hmm. um, but in an economic world you can say that like oh these statistics indicate that man will choose this or that 
right. thing. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Five, the period of adjustment. Oh yeah, the period of adjustment. <laughs> this is great. What can we say about the period of adjustment? How can we measure it? Well, uh, the period of adjustment is really important because entrepreneurs, they try and guess like which way the wind is blowing and, and what things are going to happen in the future. But if you don't know how long it's going to take for that to happen, then you don't know anything. Because, for example, I am bullish on BSB and have been for a while. But during the time that I've been bullish on BSB, it's gone down a whole lot. <laughs> a lot. And I think that it's really good and that more people are going to be using BSB. But I am... I am totally in the dark about this period of adjustment where I, I'm not studying enough what the period of adjustment is going to be when people realize that BSV is good and that it becomes the best thing. Yeah. So. I don't think it'll be too long. It's a real. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I didn't think so either, but. I think. What do I know? When I was listening to this, I thought a lot about Peter Schiff because Peter oh. Schiff's been predicting the, the meltdown for at least four years yeah they call him dr doom right yeah and you know i his arguments seem to be correct but you know his timeline is kind of right but i don't know he's been predicting this huge economic meltdown for a really really long time yeah. but I, I think he's right but it's his the time period the period of adjustment period of right. adjustment is a little off. Well, those who've been who've been listening to Peter Schiff hopefully have been acquiring a lot of gold from his gold company, been right. selling a lot of gold on his sphere that he puts out. Yeah, uh, but right he's not he's not wrong about yeah. the the points that he makes. It's just he he also is clear that he doesn't know when. You know, he doesn't know when, but then yeah. he knows why. Right. Yeah, he is clear about that. Yeah. And I guess that's, and it's interesting you find it in this book, because I've always heard that was the knock on Austrians in general. They, they know why it's going to happen, they know, but they can never, never say when. Who can say? It depends on people, but how much values, knowledge. but like how much value is in that when question. It seems like a lot. it's worthwhile trying to figure it out. Almost all of the value, <laughs> because, uh, you know, if you've got another 20 years, then you'll make a lot of this different decisions than if it, you've only got till tomorrow. Right. Well, if they you can just keep printing money. And it seems like it they can. <laughs> it's wild. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe they can. For 20 more years. Yeah, I don't know. What does Mises thinks, think of Keynes, Keynes's famous phrase, in the long run, we shall all be dead. I remember him saying that, but I, I don't recall. What do you think about the phrase, in the long run, we shall all be dead? In in Keynes's, in the Just context the of economics? Yeah. Or that mindset. Who cares? We'll be dead. Well, I... Um, I'm like it, as much opposed to that concept as possible um, because every action that you make as a human on this planet has an impact forever that every action you make matters not only in material means like consumption of um, the coffee that I'm drinking mm -hmm. um, being not available for, for me tomorrow, but also in the signal that I send to the coffee producers to make more of it. Mm -hmm. You know, so every action that I take has like a million different impacts, you know, in the type of energy that I'll have to type on my keyboard today and produce more output or um, in the conversations that I'll be able to have with people out into the world, or the speed at which I'm speaking, and the content that I can put into the video that I'm making, and there, every action that you make matters. And then, because I'm making a video, even after I'm dead, 
there's this uh, lasting impact that affects other people and the decisions that they make. And because we're talking about economics, it's good. in the long run, we'll all be dead. Yeah, okay, that may be true that on an infinite timeline, no actions matter, um, but we don't, we, we live in the now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was well put. I think to tie it into this section, I would add, you got to think about the period of adjustment and you never know what's going to happen in the long run and what's going to change. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious to know because I think I, I made a point that may be tangential to the point that Mises yeah. was trying to make here. What, what do you think he was trying to get at? The market adjusts to changes in the data, but each change sets in motion a process of adjustments that may take more or less time. The task for entrepreneurs is not merely to anticipate the direction, but also the rate of the market market's adjustment to new realities. The classical econ economists systematically studied previously unrealized long-run consequences of government intervention. Excuse me. Economics does not ignore the short run. A long-run analysis necessarily includes the immediate effects of a change. Ah, uh, the long run analysis necessarily includes the immediate effects of a change. What's an example of that? Like, um, government prints more money, the long term effect would be inflation short-term effect would be more spending mm -hmm. but maybe in the long run that means that the people will have less be able to spend less because they won't be able to consume as much because they've consumed too much in the here and now mm -hmm. okay so yeah all right that's still a little bit shaky to me i don't fully understand that point i think but... we covered it pretty well we have the same idea like okay. in the long run we shall all be dead seems like a it it puts less emphasis on your time preference yeah and, and it, it seems dismissive of all, the, the act the consequences of actions right yeah it it seems like a silly philosophy to live by yeah. Um, okay. What else? What else is there? Six. The limits of property rights and the problems of external costs and, and external economies. What is the problem associated with so-called public land? The problem associated with so-called public land? I don't recall. I mean, it's, I can name a few things. Um, it's because um, people using the public land, they don't have they don't have to account for the degradation of the land per se. Right. Yes. Uh, this is the point he made about factories, right? Where um, people created factories and polluted the air. Mm -hmm. and didn't have to take personal responsibility for the pollution right. or the, the contaminants that they put into the, the public areas, mm -hmm. like rivers and stuff. Yeah, that seems like the hardest problem for private property and just freedom in general. There needs to be a way of accurately measuring your impact, environmental impact, and that sounds like something really hard to measure. Yeah, but I think it could happen over a long period of, for example, uh, if all, if there were no such concept as public land, mm -hmm. um, I would own the air outside of my house. And if I could take a reading and be like, 
Look at all these particles and all this contaminants. Like, I know that's coming from this factory, hey, factory lawsuit. You gotta, you can't put that onto my land, onto my property. You gotta contain that or clean it or do something with it, but it can't be in my backyard. Mm -hmm. And they would be like, all right, fine. That's reasonable. Yeah. It Our seems like it'll take a lot of innovation to get to that point. And when there's a giant gap of innovation needed, people just don't believe it can happen. What do you mean? For you to be able to prove that that air, that those particles are coming from a factory is going to be hard to prove that. I think the, um, you sometimes being a, also being able to accurately measure the particles around your house at any given time is going to be really hard to prove. For an individual, it may be, but I could see something like a, a lawyer being like, ah, I could devise a class action lawsuit, get 30,000 people in this town to pay me just a little bit each, and then I could go against this big company and pillage them for like a million dollars or more to say, okay, you can't hurt these people and their land. Um, and just the, the threat of that being possible is enough to potentially deter future factories from yeah future factories doing, from producing but not maybe, from producing right but like you need to be able to prove it because like okay maybe the factory is doing that but you have thirty thousand houses around here that could also be very well doing the same thing and uh, you'll need to prove that they're not and right it's to, it, so the factory that. would say like no that's the chimney smoke from each of these houses right so, yeah so it, it's something really really hard to measure and like well it's the downside of like having like all these different segmented private properties is like i think it's good very very good but it, it presents a really hard challenge of being able to measure things as individuals rather than this giant collective mm -hmm. yeah we need and, I think it can be done. There's just a lot of innovation that needs to be done in that area. But that innovation isn't going to happen unless, like, there's, I don't know, there's need. First, we need private property rights. I need to be able to claim that I own, you know, the air outside my house. Right, and you need to be able to measure the air outside your house. Well, yes. you have to define the air outside your house. Like, what is it? Like, as soon as air moves onto your property, is it not yours? Yeah. What if you, so, but, so, what if you create a vacuum and you suck up all the air into your property, and you're just stealing people's air? Then I'm, a, I'm like a, a troll for a uh, Yeah, you could put a, a troll. You could have a bubble. Oh, this has you bad could, stuff in it, and you, you cost well, it. Well, think so. about it. If you had a dome around your property, and you created a vacuum that just sucked up all the air, are you stealing air? Hmm. I don't. I don't know. Because if you own the air outside your property, maybe you're stealing all the good air. Maybe so. But to the to the point of pollution, which is a real problem. I think the the solution is, and w I think Mises would agree, that. Private property rights could solve this problem by allowing the people who are being polluted upon to seek justice from the polluters mm -hmm. and make them personally responsible. Because if they're personally responsible for the effects of their actions, as they should be, then not only will they pay a penalty if they do harm, but future factories and, and polluters, would-be polluters, have a disincentive to pollute and an incentive to invest in cleaner output. I think an unintended consequence is once you give, once that's a regular thing, polluters being sued, there'll be, there'll be a lot more frivolous lawsuits and it'll discourage factories from even starting up because they're afraid of getting sued. I think that's an unintended consequence. Yeah. I thought of a kind of a cool idea when I was reading this, and so 
and I don't know how exactly this would work, but so you produce something that, like anything, and it has like an RFID chip or something, and so everything is linked to the blockchain, and there's there's a bounty for every like recycled. I guess it's a tax. So, it's a tax that goes into this giant public pool for, um, let's say, all all Coca Cola cans. So, so that I follow you, I'm Coca Cola. I produce Coca Cola cans. Right, and, and each so you're, can is a has serial a number. Of, yeah, has on the ser- blockchain. yeah, a serial number on on the blockchain. Okay. And for every can you produce, you have to put like one Satoshi into this public pool, and. Okay. When that, so that pool is a bounty for anyone that returns a can or disposes properly of the can. Um, but then this pool, so this, so it's used to incentivize the, like, um, incentivize collecting like the trash of the recyclers. That makes sense. And then there's an also like this pool should be also be some type of organization that like removes like carbon from there, does things like that. It's just it's hard to do it like in a completely public way. So I'm imagining It's almost I'm... like a DAO if you could do it. It's a separate entity? Like the pool that the, the Satoshi goes into goes into this DAO. The cleaner DAO? Yeah, the, the, the environmental DAO. Okay. That seems like it could be very dangerous. But, um... Could be awesome. So, you're saying, I'm Coca-Cola, you're the environmental DAO, mm-hmm. and I produce a bunch of cans, aluminum, yeah. and I serialize each number and then register it on the blockchain, and I pay one Satoshi or something yeah. per, per can to you. And yeah. then... And then, That's held in trust yeah. for anyone, uh, Stephen, who comes along and collects a bunch of cans, yeah. gives them to you, and you're like, great, these are serial number, beep, 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 here's your Satoshis. Yeah. Any that are not returned, you now have extra Satoshis that go into yeah, go cleaning into clean. the environment. Right. And then in that way, I am paying for all of the cleaning of the products that I produce. So I'm taking personal responsibility right. and not making someone else responsible for mm-hmm. cleaning. That seems better than what we have today in, yeah. in terms of responsibility. Right. More moral. You'd have to be able to design the DAO in a way that is fair, like, It's hard to create an organization that doesn't like have like a a group of like people that privilege are privileged because of it. Why shouldn't there exist competition? So your DAO, environmental DAO A, there could be environmental because DAO B. Coca, he's, okay, his Coca Cola has to pay. It's a tax. It's basically, they're forced to pay this. And Why should I be forced? Maybe it's just great for me. Oh, uh, to pay into the DAO. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess it is voluntary. Yeah. And you just get everyone to pay into this DAO. I mean, yeah. Right. As a company, I I want to be I want to look great. Mm-hmm. So I'm like I'm way better than Pepsi. I pay for the environment, right. and I have the highest rated environmental DAO that I pay. Not that shifty one, <laughs> you know, that's full of uh, crooks. Mm-hmm. Okay. We have two more questions. All right, let's do it. What is the difference between the American and European experiences with forestry? I don't, I don't know this. Boy, I, I don't recall that either. Hmm. There, there's nothing in the study guide about that. Well, it's... Um... Let's just talk about forestry and uh, as it relates to public land. What is the subject of the... Um... The limits of property rights and 
the problems of external costs in external economics. Okay, so I don't know which is which, but I would imagine in a situation where people privately own the forests, they have an incentive to produce more trees. So in the lands where Kimberly Clark, the largest paper producing company, um, has the rights to public land, like uh, in Canada, they just clear cut. Right. Like, great, here's all the trees, we're taking them, we're not planting more. But then in the places where they own land, like in the U.S., um, they plant two trees for every one they cut down. Mm -hmm. And that way they're like farmers of trees and they just, they always have an incentive to produce more. It's not like a farmer runs out of pigs after they slaughter them. They're always planting more pigs, so. Yeah. This is so, I think the best example of this is public versus private pools. Example. Like, have you ever been to a public pool? Not really. The one in Portsmouth, but oh. it's, it's lovely. Yeah. Well, okay, so I grew up in Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> and the public pools are, are gross. Like, you don't want to be there. And it's because, like, it's a public pool. Like, people don't take care of it. They don't care. Like, yeah, it's they're just disgusting versus a private pool where like they're actually taken care of and maintained and last for a while. Mm. I think that's like the easiest example of public lands versus private lands. Something I'm way more familiar with is public bathrooms versus private okay, bathrooms. Okay, yes. Right. So when I go to somebody's house, there's like always toilet paper and yeah. there's often potpourri and it's like really beautiful and the floor is clean and the toilet's clean, and there's soap, and like, but when I go to public bathrooms, often I'm really f afraid to even touch the handle to the door. Right. There's nowhere to wash my hands, and like, they're out of paper towels, so, yeah. Is Mises for or against government grants of patents and copyrights? What do you think? I think I am I'm for copyrights and patents simply because just from my own if I have a really good idea like everyone's been in this situation you have a really good idea or you have a funny comment or something you say it and then someone else goes and says it or does it and they get the laugh or they get the credit and just my own feeling personally I feel like oh man that was mine like that was like that's not fair I I should get credit for that like I should profit off that you own that joke I own that joke or yeah and so yeah I think I have a right to it just the way just for my own internal feelings. What do you think should happen to someone who steals a joke? Steals a joke? Um, yeah, if that's your property mm -hmm. and you own it, um, what should the consequence be for that? <laughs> that's a good question. I don't know. What do you think Mises thinks? Because uh, that was the question. Right. Well, I mean, you asked what I thought. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What do you think Mises uh, thinks? <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, I... He's probably not for it. Why? I'm not sure. I, I remember him saying something in this section about the originator of a thing benefits simply by being the originator. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I produce a new drug and it's, it's really difficult. It takes years of research and development to produce. I can put it out there, and it will be a while, some period of time, before anyone can reproduce it. And if they do reproduce it, they may not reproduce it perfectly. And even if they do reproduce it perfectly, they still don't have my brand of like, hey, this came from Bayer, you know? You can trust Bayer. Uh, because we've been producing stuff for a long time and we're great at it. Um, 
but proponents of patents and trademarks or whatever, I guess they're different things, proponents of copyrights and patents would say, oh no, Bayer should be able to punish anyone who reproduces their chemical composition that they created, Tylenol or whatever, because that's theft of an idea. But I don't think that's valid. Um, because I don't think you can own a, a series of notes or a series of words in a particular order or a particular idea if it can be copied without um, for example <clears throat> if I if you have a bike and I disassemble your bike and reassemble it over here, I have taken your bike. But if I see your bike and make an exact reproduction on my own, with my own materials, then I have not stolen your bike. You still have, you still get to use your bike. And in that way, copying is not theft. I've made two, we now have two bikes. What if it's a piece of software? Just copy <clears throat> the, the, the code. Then we have two. You still get to use yours. I haven't taken anything from you in that way. Yeah, but I built that software for you to be able to run on your computer and pay me. Yeah. But you don't pay me if you copy it and run it. Yeah. So I think I'm not going to build it if you're just going to copy it. Is it possible to build software in a way such that people can't um, copy it? Yeah, you don't. You you keep the code private. Closed source. Yeah. And I guess there are advantages and disadvantages to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough issue. I don't. I'm not sure. So, can I read this section? I'm not even Please. sure what Mises thinks. Yeah. Okay. Privileges and quasi-privileges. Legal restrictions on the market economy are not uniformly enforced and respected. If some citizens are exempt from a restriction, this is a privilege. If some citizens simply flout the laws, this is a quasi-privilege. Such cases may lead to monopoly gains or different rents. Differential rights. Hmm. And that's the that's the last question. On this topic. That so look, the, the AnyPay brand and logo, if someone just copies it, like it's an idea. And like, there's been a lot of work into creating that symbol and creating an idea around it. Yeah. And if someone just takes that and uses it, I I just I don't think that's fair. That might be, <clears throat> excuse me. That might be a different issue. <clears throat> excuse me. I gotta get some water. Um, Taking a logo and putting it on a product that is not representative of something that yeah. any pay produces is fraud. But making a copy of any pay and using it without claiming that it's what it if is, someone just takes the logo and uses it for their business? That's Call fraud. It something different. I think that that would be fraud. Why? Because it's misleading the public. It's misleading your customers, saying that this is any pay, but it's not. But it's an idea. And you, like you just you said that. Like you, sh you shouldn't have a right to like a series of words or ideas. So, uh, this is a 
an issue that I just learned about at last year's um, FSB DAC. There's a trademark and patent attorney mm -hmm. who attends these things named Glenn. Cool guy. He's the one who let me know that NEPA's um, trademark was up for, um, it, it was about to lapse, yeah. the, the previous owner. And he was like, you should get in and register your trademark. Yeah. Um, and I was like, yeah, well, you know, I don't know because I don't believe people can really own the ideas and I don't, I don't think that's right. You know, I don't want to enforce. And he was like, yeah, but imagine this. Say someone produces this really crappy version of any pain mm -hmm. and it steals money from people and it's, it's, it's doing awful stuff and it calls itself any pain. I was like, well, that would be fraud. That they're they're it, they're saying that they're us, but they're not us. And that's it's like it's like if I started packaging cyanide bread and calling it Wonder Bread, Wonder Bread would be like, hey, you can't do that. That's not us. Um, and I'd be like, well, you can't own that name. And they're like, yeah, but you're deceiving people. You're making them think that we're the, you're this trusted name. Mm -hmm. But if I were to steal Wonder Bread's recipe and have the exact same recipe and call it Derek's bread or whatever, I think that would be legit because they can't own the chemical composition of the bread that they sell. Does that make sense? I think it's a yeah, difference what? with a distinction or distinction with a difference. So what about a book? Like what if you just wrote like a crappy book and called it The Hobbit? Is that, are you not allowed to use The Hobbit? I think that would be fraud. Yeah, I think that would be unfair to the the real creator of The Hobbit. I mean, you should call it something else. You should call it like... Because that's already taken. That's already a thing. I don't think... So anyone someone should, owns the idea. Yeah, but if you wanted to make a million copies of The Hobbit, I think you should be allowed to do that. And sell them? Yeah. Why not? You're producing copies of a thing. If you want a copy of The Hobbit, here. So, but, like, how is that fair to the content producer? Like, if you just happen to specialize in manufacturing books and distributing it to the public, you're going to make way more profit than the person who actually wrote down the ideas because they specialized in creating stories and great literature and that necessarily, like... Right. I think that the value of being a content producer comes in a different way. So, if I were making a million copies of human action and selling them, my business is in distribution. And I'm being rewarded for distributing a thing. Yes. Producing and distributing it. The author... He gets a different type of value. Mises gets credibility for having produced the work. I still I can't change the name on this mm -hmm. and say Derek wrote it. That was so a fraud. Mises will have to figure out how to profit from that. Right. Mises gets to give speeches or you know, he gets all this personal capital. Like if he writes another book, people are gonna be like, That's awesome. I want that because He's, he's got the name associated with Yeah, they with want it. that, because, but you're going to be the one distributing it to them. Maybe... He won't make... He'll never make money off of this book. It'll, he'll have to come up with another thing. And, but, like, maybe there's someone who specializes in speechy, speeches about Mises' book. Like... Yeah. Like, maybe. what if he just wants to specialize in writing the book? Like, he should have... Again, like, specialize in writing these ideas. Like, yeah. What you're saying is requiring him to spe specialize in something other than that to make an actual profit. Yeah, I think he's he will have to figure out a way to capture the value. That he isn't produces. that a problem? Like you're not allowing someone to specialize in that idea, like in that those ideas of creation. Well, what's the alternative? He has rights over these ideas, so he can spend all of his time. Writing, he, he doesn't have to go make spe speeches. He doesn't have to go ha and figure out how to make a profit off of his name. 
he can just profit off of the ideas in his book. Well, who's, writing it. So he'll be more motivated to write more and more books. Maybe. I, I still am unclear as what you propose would be the moral consequence for someone who reproduced Mises' book and sold it. Well, then I think they're stealing his property. His ideas. How? They're taking his ideas and... Well, they haven't put their name on it. Right. I think content creators should be able to own their ideas and their data. And, and who should enforce that? Who should enforce that? Um, whatever jurisdiction, like whatever the laws are around that, around theft. So you come up with a poem, mm -hmm. and I reproduce that poem with, with your name attached and mm -hmm. sell it uh, with a nice picture frame or something, and that's a crime? If I, if, if you don't pay me something, I think so. And I think it'll lead to more, I think it'll lead to more production too. Not even just moral, I think it will lead to more wealth because I am being paid for my ideas and I'll be able to continue to produce poetry. What do you think would happen if th that were not the case? If we lived in a world where people did not own or have a right to money from people who reproduce their work? I think I would be able to produce less poetry for the world because I would have to go out and wait tables in my spare time because I need money to eat and stuff. So I'm not spending that time writing poetry. Hmm. And so the world will be less, uh, with less of my pro poetry in the world because I wasn't able to make money off of it to sustain myself. If, if it were the case that Mises didn't profit, if some evil publisher was publishing all his work without his permission, yeah. putting it out there and selling it, and he was alive today, what do you think he would do? What Mises would do? No, you. You were like, hey, I read this book. Yeah. I really liked it. Yeah. Mises. Right. Here you are waiting tables. Right. Do you think you would like give him money? Or I don't, but I don't think you should have to rely on donations. Like that's not it. Should just be rely on like, like I I don't think you should have to rely on donations. No, I don't think so either. So what would maybe what would he do? Like sell his signatures, cop signature copies of books or something, or like what if uh, I could ship this book to him and have him sign it for a hundred bucks. That's still a donation. That's I, I, I think that it's a you, product. Yeah, it's a product, right? It's a product that only comes from him being the creator of the thing. And it's completely moral because, uh, you know, it doesn't rely on him bringing guns in, into my face or into the publisher's face for doing nothing more than reproducing work and making more of it. Really, he should thank the, the reproducer because if he is not capable of distributing millions of copies of a book, but a distributor is, well, as the author, I might be really happy that someone wants to reproduce my work to get the ideas out there to more people than I can. Mm -hmm. Don't you think? I can see your argument, and I'm, I'm not sure. It's hard to have strong opinion without going through the process of developing a work that's been out into the public ethos. So. Well, I've, I've produced a movie. 
-hmm. I made it free. I put it on YouTube. Mm -hmm. People torrent the movie. Right. I also sell DVDs. Yeah. And what's interesting is it's available for free, yet people buy DVDs mm -hmm. because they want to support the movie, right. or they'll um, they'll buy things from me, or they'll send me donations, or they they'll ask me to speak at a conference, whereas they wouldn't have otherwise. Mm -hmm. I could have controlled distribution and only sold DVDs, but I don't think I would have had as much success. And I would never punish someone for reproducing my movie and putting it out there. Now, if they called it Brandon Bryant's Victimless Crime Spree, yeah. I'd be like, that is fraud, man. <laughs> you can't do that. That's not legit. Uh-huh. Yeah, I guess as content creators, you do want to get your ideas out there. Maybe the solution is creating a better way for content creators to produce them and distribute themselves. Like streamanity. Yeah. Where right. it seems like it seems like there's whole con like it's there just needs to be more innovation in that and content creators to consumers and I think this whole distribution of ideas is gonna get easier for individuals to do yeah especially with the internet like if Mises was around today he could put his book on a site where you, right. I you feel have like, to pay yeah like to a get paywall it. yeah now other people could put it on a torrent there and I think that's, you but I do. think that's wrong. I think if you put something on a paywall, like your content on a paywall, I don't think someone should screenshot it and share it for free. Yeah, I did that, with yeah. not from, uh, but not with Victimless Crime Spree, with another video that had a paywall. Someone ripped it and and put it out there. Nothing I can do. What am I gonna do? I just I don't think that's right. I don't think that's right. Someone yeah. produced it, they made something, and they want, like, it wouldn't have been there if it wasn't for them. One thing people can do is um, they put um, difficult to remove stamps on videos. Yeah. Like, you'll see on some, like, porn videos or mm -hmm. on, like, uh, cam girls, they'll, like, put a thing up on their screen where it's, like, if someone's copying this, you at least get a link to their website so yeah. that you know where right. you can find more content from them that people maybe will pay for. Yeah, and I think that's what you'll start seeing is more and more digital fingerprints so that when someone does remove that paywall screenshot it, like the fingerprint's still in there and you're gonna you're gonna get like threatened with like a lawsuit. I think that's the what technology's going to bring is everything's going to have a digital fingerprint attached to it. Yeah. Cool. Well, this has really been a great discussion. I know we could keep going, but we went past the time we're supposed yeah. to have a meeting. I didn't even realize. All right, let's end this. <laughs>